May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please take a seat. We don't often preach on the Old Testament. I normally focus on, on Jesus and what he's up to. Uh, but with the Song of Songs, I thought, I've got to do it. You know? Um, and I recently heard this idea. And it's, it's a really beautiful idea. And I, I suspect you're going to be hearing re- references to it quite a lot. It's this, that each, that scripture is like a many faceted gem. So each piece of scripture, depending on how you hold it to the light, might reveal something new. Now, that's actually quite a different idea than the one we often take. Because we often, and this is one of those things, we often go, what's the right understanding of that? What's the right understanding of that? Can you imagine if someone gave you uh, you know, a nice ring with a big diamond on. And you went, what's the right way to look at this? Is there a right angle? And every other angle is wrong. It's nuts. It's like, oh, look at that, look at that. And you move it and it sparkles. It's great. And scripture's like that. If we move it and we look at it from different angles and in different lights, it shines in different ways. So, the many-faceted gem that is Scripture. Now, when it comes to the Song of Songs, it's structured like a really beautiful love poetry dialogue. We have two people who are talking to each other. And uh, we get his words, her words, his words, her words. And it's lovely. You know, it's, it's young people and they're in love. And, and, and I love the language. It's like, oh, can you hear my beloved Look, he's coming. He's leaping upon the mountains. He's bounding over the hills. He's like a gazelle. I don't think Louise ever said I look like a gazelle. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly I'm devastated. No, no. Or a young stag. Uh, no. Honestly, I think my, my animal... Look at that. He looks just like a wombat. <laughs> Ah, and isn't it fabulous? Isn't it wonderful and a thing to be celebrated? That in Scripture, and you know, the Scripture is collated, and, it, and it's gathered together by, back then, uh, especially the Old Testament, by probably older academics, uh, because it was in Babylon, and to become an academic, you've got to have sort of done all those things in life, like a family, you can't be focused on raising children and, and building a home and those sorts of things and spend all the time in the world studying and learning and engaging in conversations, you know. So, so, so most of Scripture is probably assembled by kind of older people. And back then, mostly men, of course. Isn't it a wonderful thing? Isn't it a wonderful thing that these men sitting around, and I picture them sitting around a table, I mean, they probably weren't really, but they thought, you know what? In our tradition, we have this beautiful celebration of young people in love. And that's important to remember. It's important to remember that it's not all just sort of interesting head knowledge or pieces of history that talk about Uh, how Israel is being moved through the nations and how God is drawing us back. Sometimes we just have to to take a moment to celebrate life. To celebrate young people in love. And I think that's really important for us because otherwise we start to get this picture in our minds that there are some things that are particularly holy, you know, coming to church, putting on the right clothes for Sunday morning, and other things that are are not. And this says, no, no, no. The holiness can be found in many things. Yes, we come here and we celebrate it and we we draw draw attention to it, but holiness can be found in many things. Many things are sacred, not least the love of two people for each other. That's wonderful. That's great. 
So that's one angle, one little facet on this. It's just a celebration of love. I think that's a great thing. And when we do those weddings and stuff, it's wonderful. The next thing that I think is worth celebrating or worth thinking of, and maybe we turn, picture we're turning the gem just a tiny bit. And now we're kind of looking at this from, from a time in history when uh, it's around the year sort of 300 to sort of 500, and it's the Desert Fathers, for those of you who want to kind of go back and do some back research. And they're looking at Scripture, particularly the Old Testament, and they're seeing in there a lot of metaphors and analogies. And what they're seeing is they're going, in, this script, in these Scriptures, we might find pre-echoes, in a sense, of Christ who comes to be with us. And so they look at Song of Songs and they go, this is the hymn that's the conversation between the church and God. And it's, and it's, it's, and what, what, in this part of the hymn, because traditionally in this, the, the feminine voice is cast as the church and the masculine voice is cast as the voice of God. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, a good love poem, it doesn't matter who's saying what, does it? But traditionally, the feminine voice is cast as the church and the masculine voice is cast as God. And the church is sitting there and they're going, let us look to the world. And we hear the voice of God in so many things, and we celebrate it. And we see God coming to us. And in Christ, we see God coming to us and calling to us, standing outside and saying, come, be with me. There is great joy in life and celebration out here. And then the, the metaphor moves on to spring. And now spring is just one of those wonderful times because spring is the time, and we do this in, all, in a lot of our poetry and in our narratives, where we look and we see life blooming. And uh, I, you know, I, I, if, I'm, if I'm picturing spring, although I've never actually seen this, I've never seen this in real life, but this is the picture I have of kind of, you know, it's, it's an almost barren and a, you know, maybe a little bit of snow. I grew up in South Africa. <laughs> Not a lot of snow. Um, at least where I live, not a lot of snow here in Bundaberg, but this is my picture. And you see just like one little plant start to come in a emer life emerging. And there's an abundance of life and, I don't know, I picture little fawns for spring. That's you. But there's life. There's life. And the trees start to put out, you know, fruit and all the rest of it. We might celebrate new life. And Christ says to the church, come, and in me there is new life. Another facet of scripture. Isn't it beautiful? So now, I don't think necessarily that that was the original intention of the writers some 2,700 years ago or so when that was written down. But it's still a good light to bring to this. One more thing. And this is a far more modern uh, take on the matter. Far more modern take. Uh, and I don't know if you're, if you're sort of aware, but in the history of the church, we've done pretty well for the most part with taking care of people. And that's why there's church hospitals, church schools, those sorts of things. But we haven't always necessarily extended that picture to taking care of the broader environment. I and mean, we have people like St. Francis and... Around St. Francis Day, we'll, we'll get all the pets in and we'll have the blessing of the pets and we'll remember that. But it's worth our while taking a look at this passage from a, a context in which nowadays we are far more aware of our impact on the natural world than perhaps we might have been many, many years ago. And I want to say, isn't it amazing that even... 2,600 years ago, they were able to look at the natural world, you know, uh, flowers appearing, singing and turtle doves, vines and blossom, fig trees bearing figs, and they were able to see these things as echoes of the gifts of God. And they were able to see these things, the environment around them, as this is a sign of life. 
from God. Now, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I find that if I go out and I buy myself something, like a, say a coffee mug, I'm using a coffee mug because I have a collection. <laughs> if I buy myself a coffee mug and something happens and it breaks, I go, oh well, that costs four bucks. Yeah. And I move on. But if I am gifted something like a coffee mug, it could be exactly the same coffee mug, and something happens and it breaks, my heart breaks with it. Because I, that was a gift from someone. They saw that and they thought of me. And that's, that's special. So I tend to take more care of things that have been given to me than things that I've purchased. And so... I wonder if in another light, this passage talks to us about the fact that if we look at the world around us as a gift from God who loves all humanity, I wonder how God's heart breaks when we don't care for that. So many lights, many facets to Scripture and if from the Song of Songs you want to take away that life is worth celebrating and is holy, that's wonderful. If you want to take from the Song of Songs that Christ is God's love song to the church and we are called to respond, that's beautiful. If you want to take from it a reminder that we should care for the environment, I think that's timely. But most of all, I'd like you to take from it an appreciation of Scripture and its many, many voices. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.